Global Justice Ecology Project last interviewed Mike Africa Jr. of the MOVE organization during the 2019 North American Forest and Climate Movement Convergence, which GJEP co-organized. Mike was a keynote speaker. In this follow-up interview, Mike discusses the racial disparity seen during the handling of the Capitol riots, a recent HBO documentary that features his work to free his parents from prison, and the apology issued by the City of Philadelphia to the MOVE organization over the 1985 bombing of a MOVE house which killed 11 people, including five children. According to your biography, you are part of a Black Philly radical collective um, and your mission is to be a cog in the wheel of a much needed revolutionary global change. Um, and you work yes. on issues uh, uh, tackling uh, mass incarceration, police brutality and climate change. With that introduction, how are you doing? And uh, please bring us up to speed. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Steve. I, I really do appreciate it. And I'm happy that we can connect after so much time, a lot's happened since the last time we were, were together. Um, uh, coronavirus didn't exist in the way that it does now for us. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot's happened since then. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I've been active. I'm, I'm busy working on a lot of things, a um, lot of projects. One of the projects that I'm working on now is my podcast called On the Move with Mike Africa Jr. We talk about issues and struggles of the, of, uh, of the day, of the people and um, try to find ways to insert solutions to people and connect to the broader audience and the, and the broader uh, population of people so that we can get more hands on deck to help uh, deal with some of the problems that we have in the society. Well, one of the things we wanted to talk to you about, uh, Mike, was uh, since uh, we spoke last, uh, there was a resolution by the Philadelphia City Council. It was an apology uh, to the MOVE organization for the bombing uh, in May 13, 1985, that left 11 MOVE members dead, including five children. The resolution said that it was uh, for the immeasurable and enduring harm uh, done. Um, do you have a response to that resolution? The interesting thing is that there's no way that you can, that a, a, a family could, a, could accept an apology from, you know, someone that killed their family. Right, eleven family members, five of them were children. Um, but the people that the the council members that put that 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 resolution into in, into play like that, they were not the people that were responsible for that. They uh, specifically Jamie Gautier, who was a brand new council member, she um, did that as a request as a favor to some of our uh some of our supporters because we we felt that it would help in these times getting out information about how to how how people sh should understand this information how people learn the story of of what happened and how we can move forward so that this kind of thing never happens again so as far as the, the apology itself is is much more than just an apology. It's a uh, it's a declaration, right? It's a it's a way to insert and introduce uh, ways uh, of engagement between citizens and law enforcement uh, as a way uh, to of engagement to, uh, between citizens and their neighbors. You know, you don't have to drop a bomb on someone for any reason. And what the police did, what the city of Philadelphia allowed and, and pushed for on May 13th was something that should have never been, uh, been. And we need to use this as a way to teach people so that this never happens again in any community. So the apology was uh, put in place as a stepping stone to get to that. Uh, is it May 13th? Every year there's going to be an annual observation within the city? Yeah, so that's part of the that was part of the resolution to make May 13th a day of remembrance, recommitment and observation. And those three things were very important within this so that people understand like um what they're being committed to or recommitted to, what they're observing, right? And so like that there is an annual day for this that um 
And uh, this coming May 13th is the first one uh, that we will have. Uh, what is the status of the Move 9 now? I think I, I read, sadly, uh, that there was a member who was uh, uh, released. I think it was Delbert Africa. Uh, and he died months after being released. Uh, so um, is, is is that a true report? And uh, what, is, what is the status? Of, yeah, of, of, it, it is true. Hmm. It's a true report. Um, Delbert came home um, and he was home for six months. And he passed away on June 16th uh, at the same on the same day, two years after I went and picked up my mom, who was the first move member, uh, move, move nine member to be released. He died around the same time on the same on that two year anniversary. The, the rest of the move nine members. Uh, except for Chuck, they are relatively healthy. You got to uh, also. Keep in mind that they're aging, right? The youngest one is 64, right? So, um, and, but they're all, but even with that, they're still, they're still relatively health, healthy, except for Chuck, who has stage four cancer. So, uh, Mike, I, I did want to ask you, um, there, there was the movie that came out, uh, it, and it detailed your efforts uh, to get uh, your family and the, and the move nine out of prison. Um, I think it was called uh, 40 Years a Prisoner. Uh, so, uh, Mike, what, what was that like? Uh, did, I mean, could you give us a little, just, I mean, a, a little bit of what it was like uh, to be part of that project? It was an interesting project because... I don't know. I, it was a bunch of cameras following me around for the last three years. And th th they were just doing, they were following me around watching me do what I do. And I, I didn't really have to change anything except sit down for some interviews from time to time. But the digging through files to try to find the needle in the haystack to show my family's innocence, going to protests, demonstrations, and linking up with people to do activities, to try to find other strategies, all, all that is stuff that I do already. So they were following me around while I was doing these things. And the interesting thing was watching it on a screen, on a television, watching myself do it. <laughs> uh, but it really wasn't any, I mean, it, the probably the most interesting thing about that project was watching some of the archival footage that I had never seen before. I had never seen my mother when she was arrested. I had never seen the actual arrest where the police took her into custody, put her hand behind her back with the handcuffs, took my sister out of her arm, my baby, who was two years old, two-year-old baby, took her out of my mom's arms. And at the time, my mom was eight months pregnant with me. I had never seen my father thrown to the ground and, and, and handcuffed by the police. I'd never seen that before. So to see some of that, and that, and, and that was, that was one portion of the footage that I had never seen, but there were many other parts that were similar. So that was really interesting to see. So what was the reaction of any of the move nine that, uh, you know, of that watched, watched a lot the, of tears, uh, a hmm. lot of tears. People, people watched it. They watched themselves as younger people. You know, they were 20 years old when that happened. And now they're 60. You know, they, they, they got a chance to see people that aren't here anymore. That were their co-defendants that they went down with. You know, um, they got a chance to see their babies who are grandparents now, but were babies back then. And they hadn't seen them in that way for 40 years there was a lot of a lot of emotion people people were reliving uh, an extraordinary moment in their history that changed the course of their life forever and um <clears throat> i've never i've never been an old man who was robbed of his youth but I saw a lot of that look on their faces. You know, when you look at some of them who lost a husband or a wife, when you look at some of them who lost a child, 
their parents were gone while they were in prison. You see the that that grief on their faces as they watched the film. But they all said that it was a very important film. They were all happy with the film. While they were drying their eyes, they were congratulating Tommy and myself for making this film so well. Recently, uh, you know, uh, within the last several years or so, I mean, we've had the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. Is the film, do you think, an important film in that context? I mean, do you how, how, how do you see that? How do some of the Move 9 see that? Do you think it's uh, something that can be informative? Do you think that's something that's um, going to be embraced by the movement, per se? Well, I hope so. I think, I think that um, the people that recognize and can appreciate the struggles of my family and all that we've been through uh, and and all that we've gone through, like I, I will hope that they would embrace it, and, and for the most part, I, they have. I haven't he- I haven't heard any negativity about this film at all, and um and in fact, uh, Black Lives Matter Philly, um I, who I work closely with on a lot of projects, uh, they saw the film before, uh, before it actually got to HBO. Some uh, some of them, so um. God, we've been we've received nothing but positive views and positive vibes. Well, that's great to hear uh, that uh, it's it's seen as something very relevant uh, uh, for today. Um, so, what is the name of the, your podcast again? Name of the podcast is On the Move with Mike Africa Jr. Uh, go go check it out on uh, Spotify, on on i um, uh, Apple iPods, on uh, uh, Audible. Overcast, every platform that podcasts are found, you can find on the move with Mike Africa Jr. So, what is the what is your vision for the podcast? Really, uh, you know, I, I know um, you, you, the part of it's going to be your family story and in, in, in the move organization. I there's been an episode uh, with your mom that was uh, very engaging um, about how she had you, uh, how you were born in prison. Um, it was a very engaging episode, but what, what, what do you see, uh, as the show progresses? Do you have any uh, idea of what this, uh, you know, what, what, what the architecture of this is going to look like, you know, what, what you're going to focus on? Yeah. So like, you know, this is, this podcast is about community. Uh, it's about culture and it's about moving, the, uh, moving the thing forward. Right. We, we, we're going to, take those steps that we need to take toward getting answers. We're going to have guests on the show that can provide information and insight to issues that we have to deal with in society. One of the uh, segments that we just recorded was with Akeem Browder. Akeem Akeem Browder is the brother of Khalif Browder. uh, And Khalif Browder was a 16-year-old kid that allegedly stole a backpack without trial, without any kind of like real legal uh, court proceedings. He was in arrested. He went to Rikers Island. He spent three years at Rikers Island. He was in solitary confinement for two of those years, 16 year old kid. And he, once he was released uh, from the jail, uh, he was subpoenaed to go back to the jail, but he was so afraid of what was going to happen when he got back that he killed himself. He he was so afraid because what happened in that jail that when he was in there was he was being a beat he was being beaten by guards he was being jumped gang jumped by uh, by other inmates and the guards stood by and allowed it happen and in some cases participated in it happening. This is a sixteen year old kid, uh, and so he was so afraid that he he killed himself, and so Akeem came on the show to talk about this. His uh, the, the Akeem. The Khalif Browder Foundation focuses on mental health issues in our community. And when you have guests like Akeem that can shine a light on these things, then it also takes it to what's happening with the police department. Right here in Philadelphia, Walter Wallace Jr. was shot and killed by police. He had mental health issues. He was shot and killed by his by the police in front of his mother, in front of his sister, in front of his father, in front of his kids. Right? There's an issue of mental health. Why is it that the police are coming to these calls to talk about mental health issues 
when what should be done is a, mis- a mental health specialist should be should be uh, uh, the one called for that, right? Um, the police don't provide the solutions in our communities. And when you talk, when you have people like uh, Akeem Browder on the show, he can talk about that from firsthand knowledge, firsthand experience. Um, but also, we had Kimberly Jones on the show. Kimberly Jones uh, is the person that is most responsible, uh, most uh, recognized for her six minute video on on YouTube that went viral because she did this, made this analogy about Monopoly and how black people don't have anything. And then at the at the end of her video, she says the, the system like they are lucky that what black people are searching for is equality and not revenge. And that video went viral. Steve Harvey picked her up. He wanted to talk to her about it. Uh, uh, Trevor Noah wanted to talk to her about it. We brought her on the on the on the move with Mike Africa Jr. podcast, and we got a chance to talk to her about it too. I'm sure you probably saw uh, the um, the Capitol insurrection and the police yes. response to it. I did, mm-hmm. um, and I do know that I uh, we we also saw the response to a Black Lives Matter um, rally or protest uh, at the same location, and there were stark differences. Uh, I was wondering. Any takeaway or observations uh, regarding that? White privilege at its finest. You know, one of the things that we talked about when I talked to Akeem on the show is we talked about that exact thing. The specifically uh, the person that Riley June Williams, I think her name was, she stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop. And the, the plan for her to, with that laptop was to sell it to Russia. Right. She went home. Listen. In this case, with the, with this insurrection, these terrorists, they went to the Capitol. They did all they, thousands of people. Two police officers are dead. Four other people are dead. People are committing suicide because of it. And these people that did this are getting a slap on the wrist, uh, home on their own with cognizance. Your punishment is you can't use the Internet. You got to promise that you're not going to use the Internet. Really? And that was Black Lives Matter people, if that was members of the MOVE organization, if that was members of any organization or any people not even a part of an organization, you just got black skin, brown skin, tan skin. You're not going to be treated the same way. You're going to be treated with knocked upside the head with bullets. You're going, there's going to be so many body bags. Uh, you know, when I heard a person say, uh, well... You know, I, I said, well, they should all of them should have been arrested. It, when my parents were, according to the police involved in a, a murder that uh, where a cop got killed, they didn't have any evidence that my parents did the killing. But my parents went to prison for 40 years with a 100 year maximum just because they were there. All of these people should have been charged with with conspiracy. Six people died. Two police officers died. Right. Why aren't they charged? But the guy says, well, they, they you know, it's a lot of people. You can't just put all of them. They don't have enough jails to. To, to, to yeah, well, build some more. That's what they do with black people. And in, in 1981, in in, Philly, in Pennsylvania, there were uh, eight state prisons. In 1981, by 1993, there were 28. Who are they? Who, they they don't have a problem building prisons. So why can't they build some more? Put them in holding pens until then. That's what they do with black people. You know, it's such a it's such a listen. How the, uh, Dr. King said, "There's two Americas." One for the one for the white privilege and, and another one for all of the other people. And we're not part of the white privilege. We're part of the other people. And the, the treatment against us is us going to prison, even if we didn't even do it. While the people that are guilty of doing it, teaching people how to do it. They get to walk the streets and never serve any punishment. Listen, you got you got these people always talking about uh, we shouldn't handle our we shouldn't settle our differences with violence. Ah, they need to apply that to themselves. Every time they got a problem with somebody, they drop a bomb on them. Every time they got an issue with somebody, they shoot them. Every time they got a problem with somebody, they put them in prison. What could be more violent than those things? But they want to disarm us by telling us that we need to be peaceful. We shouldn't break windows when we when we protest. We shouldn't riot when we protest. We shouldn't uh, loot when we protest. Yeah, listen, let me tell you something. They, all they've been ever doing is rioting, looting, and 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 breaking things. Specifically, the backs of black people. Specifically, the spines and necks of black people. The internal wounds from the bullets 
that's been shot into black people. And they want to talk about we they should we shouldn't handle our differences with violence. Yeah. Yeah, well, they need to apply that to themselves. The last time we spoke, um, you, we, we, we talked a bit about the system. Uh, and uh, you, you had, and I asked you if there was hope. And uh, I always remember your response. And what I uh, said, I hope oh, I said something good. What I say? What, what you, you basically said is the system bigger than the planet? Is the system bigger than the, the need for people to breathe air? Yeah, you know? that's, that's the, and that's basically it. the system does not exist on its own, but but exists through through the power we give it by participating in it. I believe was what you exactly. said. Exactly, and 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 that's what I have hope in. I have hope that I have hope in the young people. Listen, these people are now that are that are rising up. This is like the like, like the Rainbow Coalition. Every race of people is rising up and seeing these things happen that they on a level that they ain't never been before. We ain't never seen this type of rising uprising like we saw in 2020. And we're forcing people to make changes. The system is controlled by pressure. And golly, we got some pressure on them. You know, they 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 forcing, they forcing hey, Donald Trump. We might see the first president ever go to prison. It's crazy. Like the pressure is extreme right now. And we got to keep the pressure on them. Cause if we don't, when we take the foot off the gas, we ain't gonna get where we're trying to go. So yeah, I, I got faith. I got hope. I got hope in the people. Well, Mike, thank you for taking some time to talk to us and bring us back up to speed to since the last time we spoke. Thanks for the time, Steve. I appreciate you, man.